Uh, I'm Bill Barsma, uh, president of the board of the Tacoma Historical Society, and I'm pleased indeed to uh, announce that Brian Flint is the recipient of the Tacoma Historical Society's 2020 Star of Destiny Award. The star is our way of honoring uh, people in our community who are making history, who uh, have made history in the past and have the promise of making history in the future. Uh, for the past seven years, uh, we've honored our recipients at our Destiny Dinner, fitting, most fitting indeed. And some of those that we've honored in the past uh, include uh, Stan Nakarado, Norm Dix, Karen Larkin, Lori Jenkins, Jim Walton, Claire Petrich, Laura Silas. That's just a few of the notables that we've had uh, the opportunity to, to so honor. This year, uh, our Destiny Dinner was to uh, honor the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And because of the pandemic, we weren't able to uh, to make that happen, regretfully. And therefore, in my view, um, recognizing Brian <clears throat> is very fitting uh, indeed. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about the history of Alan C. Mason and the star. And I'm gonna read from some comments made by one of our members, Jim Hoard. Um, this was at the dedication ceremony at the Mason Plaza at the Proctor District. It talks about, about the history of Alan C. Mason. I, I think you'll find this uh, interesting. He writes, no one foresaw Tacoma's destiny more clearly than Alan C. Mason. Where others saw woods and wilderness, he saw a metropolis. Mason coined the phrase, the city of destiny, over 100 years ago, and promoted our community as a wonderful place to live. Along the way, he, more than any other person, promoted Tacoma, advertising our city's strengths and East Coast papers through a dazzling illustration he called Tacoma's Star of Destiny. At its height, his advertising budget was over $5,000 a month at a time when that was real money. The bronze re rendition of the Star of Destiny as part of the Mason Plaza dates from 1910. Mason's uh, slogans on the star names all the railroads and shipping lines that serve Tacoma, points to its many manufacturing and job opportunities and its favorable geography. And he sprinkles in some reasons that you'll love living in Tacoma. Jim's favorites were, the grass stays greener all winter in Tacoma. It's ideal for retired capitalists and no poisonous bugs or reptiles can be found. So that is some of the highlights of the star, which can be seen by the way, uh, at the Mason Plaza at the Proctor District. I'd like to say a word or two about Brian and uh, his background, and then uh, I'd like to have him say a few words if he, if he might. Brian is currently the chair of the Tacoma Utility Board. And to give you some sense of the importance of that role, that board oversees a biennial budget of $1.29 billion, and the utilities include nearly 1,400 employees. He served in that capacity for nine years. Uh, prior to that, uh, he was the executive director of the Tacoma Audubon Society. I had uh, the opportunity to meet him in that capacity back when I was mayor. He was the director of communications and outreach for the Department of Natural Resources, working with Peter Goldmark, and was the executive director of the Greater um, Metro Parks Foundation. He's an active member of Rotary 8 and American Leadership Forum. And uh, he currently serves as the director of, um, of Sound Outreach. That's his current position. So uh, I'm pleased indeed to uh, to uh, introduce to you Brian Flint. I'll say a few words. Uh, Brian. Well, Bill, thank you for that honor, and I'm I'm so gr uh, gratified to be in such august company to receive this award, and I'm humbled by it. Um, and in accepting this award, I recognize that I stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, and I'd like to particularly call out uh, Elma Gilmer and Helen Engel, who helped start uh, the local chapter of the Audubon Society and, and really created the credibility for that organization that allowed uh, the work when I to take place, which included um, preventing the cross base highway from happening, um, it securing increased protections for wetlands, open space, um, and doing a lot uh, to protect habitat in Pierce County. 
Um, and I'm, uh, I'm just thinking from a, my experiences working on environmental issues from a historical perspective on that any social movement relies on um, a variety of um, spectrums of folks who believe um, uh, in moderation to more extreme views. And you find that in any, um, any social movement. And um, the success of a social movement relies on those different factions, if you will, learning how to work together and, um, and meet common goals. And so a lot of the work I've tried to do is to knit uh, folks who come from different perspectives together around a common goal. And I hope that it's uh, benefited Pierce County. I'm, I'm really proud of where we stand with Tacoma Public Utilities now. Um, we have solar panels on the roof uh, uh, of our building. Um, we have uh, for more than a decade been a leader in conservation efforts um, to uh, conserve electricity and water. And um, we have just put into place a mechanisms to um, try to electrify the transportation. Um, we have a strategic plan. We were part of uh, uh, helping to bring about the first electric school bus in, in the state of Washington. Um, we are developing plans with the port so that uh, ships can plug into our electrical system when they're in port rather than burning bunker fuel. And um, we're creating incentives for people to buy electric vehicles and learn about those. So uh, I'm happy to uh, have participated and to collaborated with so many wonderful people to bring about a cleaner, uh, more sustainable environment. And I just appreciate uh, this award. And I'm sorry that we can't all be together uh, uh, for your event um, and look forward to the next time we can do that. So thank you very much. Well, well thank you, uh, Brian. Appreciate that. Appreciate your comments. Um, a little history here. You and I first met, I believe, about 12 years ago. And there was kind of a, when you were the director of the Audubon Society, and there was kind of a utility connection to that uh, time that we met. I had this idea that wouldn't it be great for the Tacoma Dome to be solar powered? And that idea came from an experience I had in Taiwan, where I saw a big stadium that was almost entirely um, powered by solar, 50,000 people. I thought that was a great idea. I shared it with you and other members of the environmental community. At the time, I never thought that you'd become a member of the utility board. That was not on my radar screen. Uh, I'm most, most appreciative that you, you did because you're very supportive of the idea. Uh, and my, my council colleagues supported it. Uh, and, uh, and Mike Combs, who's director of the port, supported it. But at that time, uh, Tacoma Public Utilities uh, really went over like a lead balloon with uh, TPU. So I, you know, again, uh, it's an interesting session we had, and, and you gave your thumbs up along with other members of the committee. I thought it was a great idea that we should be entertained. And then uh, eventually you became a member of the board, and now you're chair of the board. And let me also say that you served your nine years on the board were rather significant in terms of the history of TPU. Uh, the board did appoint the first woman to be the director of the Tacoma Public Utilities, which that is historic. And Jackie Flowers is doing a terrific job, by the way. And uh, I think for the first time, the board, one of the first times in, in history, the board and the, and the council and the mayor have a good working relationship. In the past, there's been this kind of this tension in the past, but, but uh, not so today. So, and I think a lot of that uh, rests with your leadership and other members of the board as well. So again, my congratulations, it's well-deserved and uh, hope to see you again in the future. And at, at our future dinner that we hope to have at some point, uh, um, somewhere out there in 2021 or 2022. Thanks again, Brian. Appreciate your service. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Kim Davenport, and it is a great pleasure to be with you this evening to share a really fun Tacoma history topic. Booster songs written for and in the city of Tacoma, the city of destiny, from about the 1890s through the 1920s. Before I begin, I want to send out a great big thank you to a friend and collaborator of mine, Drew Shipman, who is a senior at the School of Music at the University of Puget Sound. He was kind enough to record a few of the songs with me. 
So in addition to hearing the stories behind the songs, uh, learning about where they came from, looking at the cover artwork, we'll actually be able to hear a few of them tonight. But let's talk first about what a booster song is. Uh, we have here an image of lyrics from a booster song about booster songs in Tacoma. Uh, you can see from this example that this was a commonly used term at the time. Uh, and the best description I've seen of what a booster song is, is that it's a musical manifestation of civic pride. What we'll see in these examples is that these are more about civic enthusiasm, advertising Tacoma to the world, than they are about writing great music. They were very, very common throughout the United States in large cities, in small towns. Uh, you are just as likely to find one about New York City as a much smaller town in the rural Midwest. And it's interesting to think about why this was true. The music publishing business was in uh, roaring form in the early part of the 20th century, and the average American home was more likely to have a piano in its living room than a car in its driveway. So this was a very effective means of advertising at a time when in most American homes there was both the instrument and the knowledge of how to play that instrument so that people could buy some sheet music, use it to gather around the piano, and hear some fun lyrics. The advertising element of these songs is really their priority rather than the musical element. Uh, so there's always uh, catchy cover art, usually very colorful. The music is typically quite simple and was in very popular styles of the day. So the most common forms are instrumental marches with no lyrics, or uh, if it is a song with lyrics, it will be a chorus that's very memorable and then often have several verses. The lyrics are very predictable and sometimes a bit clumsy and obvious in their rhyme structures. I want to get now into the specific examples because that's really the most fun. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with just an acknowledgement of the sheer number of music publishers that existed in Tacoma during this era. As I mentioned, the music publishing business was, was a booming one in all of the United States, certainly in New York and Los Angeles and major cities, but likewise in Tacoma. Here's just one example that I've taken from some of the sheet music of an advertisement for the Huntington Playwriting Company talking about how they can offer the service of custom music and songs uh, written for anyone about anything, uh, guarantee a headliner in every sketch we produce. So in other words, you could have a song written and published in Tacoma for your particular needs. Booster songs served a variety of purposes in Tacoma, I've learned from those that I've looked at. Some are pure and simple, advertising Tacoma to the world. Some celebrate a specific event. Some were written for a social club, for example, to be used as a song at gatherings. And sometimes they were commenting on issues of the day, which uh, many of those will focus on the rivalry between Tacoma and Seattle. So I'm gonna share cover art, stories, and in a few cases, the actual music. So let's jump in. The very first example uh, is actually one that does not have any sheet music with it. Uh, but this I wanted to include because it is such an early example. Uh, this comes from 1888, uh, when the completion of the Northern Pacific Tunnel uh, connected the rest of the country to the Pacific Coast. And Lucian Cook, who was a uh, railroader uh, decided to write new lyrics to an existing song. So using the music of Columbia, the gem of the ocean, he changed it to Oh Tacoma, the gem of the ocean. So it's a very early example and certainly one that's important connecting to the early railroad history of Tacoma. But it's not an example like the others I'll share with you tonight in that there's no actual sheet music being published. It's not an original song about Tacoma. The first of those that I've found comes to us from 1895 in the form of the Doolittle Republican Club March. So this is the earliest I've found. There may be others out there, uh, but my research shows this is the first uh, that I've come across. And it is an instrumental march with no lyrics. 
And the club that it is named for uh, celebrated William Doolittle, who was uh, a Republican elected to the U.S. House at that important moment when Washington's population grew to the point that we earned ourselves a second representative. This next example is just a fascinating one because it's connected to a very uh, dramatic and exciting event that took place in early Tacoma, the Rose Carnival of 1897. It was very much a tradition in early Tacoma to have festivals around the 4th of July that lasted for several days. And this Rose Carnival of 1897 was no exception. Uh, there were fireworks, uh, parades in several parts of town, many concerts around the city, and perhaps the most unusual example of a, of a civic event taking place uh, is captured in this medal uh, that comes to us from the Sports Museum collection of a world's record being set for speed walking. Uh, so it just gets at how varied the activities were for this particular event. Uh, and as with the time, the event would not have been complete without some original music written for it. And you can see from this cover art, this is very much a homemade uh, look to this cover. Someone drew this by hand. Uh, someone wrote individual names of the members of the Queen's court. Uh, and it's very uh, sort of quaint and personal in that regard. This was a, a truly huge event for this early day in Tacoma's population. Uh, according to newspaper accounts that I read, almost uh, 40,000 people participated. That is uh, about the population of the city. Uh, so just imagine an event that brings out everyone in the city, people from surrounding areas as well, parades, fireworks, music, sporting events, and custom written songs. We come next to the Salute to Tacoma from 1899. This is one of the less colorful cover images that I found. This was actually published by the Tacoma Daily Ledger. And this was a piece written by Julius Adler, who was an extremely prominent band leader on the West Coast. He actually traveled up and down the West Coast, and he formed a couple of different bands while he was here and really established a, an early tradition of uh, military and parade bands in Tacoma. So this is another instrumental march. We've yet to come to my first example that includes lyrics. We'll get to those a little bit later. And it is interesting in that it's one of the first examples that does have fairly understated cover art. Uh, it is that classic photograph, of course, though, of Mount Rainier and Commencement Bay. So I guess he thought that got the point across. All right, Glory of Tacoma from 1906 is my next example. And this is the first example with lyrics. So I wanted to share a few examples of its lyrics with you. Tacoma's gates are open wide to welcome rich and poor. That just invites a rhyme, doesn't it? Be ours the task to help Tacoma grow. That Tacoma grow slogan is one that we'll hear again later. While the choicest gifts of nature's God on every side abound, as she sits in regal splendor, peerless city of the sound. So there's one of those uh, just hit you in the face rhymes. Uh, but again, boosting Tacoma. In fact, the word boost itself appears eight times in the lyrics of this song. So these were not subtle. Uh, the, the poetry of the lyrics was not um, particularly well thought necessarily, but definitely a focus on talking about all the wonderful things about Tacoma. And we see right on the cover of this uh, cover art here that this was published right downtown in the heart of the theater district by Taylor Gardner Company. This was a, a longtime music business in Tacoma uh, that was actually in the street level of the Tacoma Theater building. All right, we heard that, that phrase about Tacoma Grow. Now we have a song called Watch Tacoma Grow from 1906. Great cover art on this one. Uh, I will point out right from the beginning that what we see here is the tortoise and the hare, uh, apparently climbing Mount Rainier, which has been very clearly labeled Mount Tacoma in this picture. So this is the earliest song I've found that does address that uh, Tacoma-Seattle rivalry. It doesn't specifically get at the Mount Rainier uh, discussion, the, the naming of the mountain discussion, but it does use that image on the cover art. 
So what's, what I found interesting about this, this piece is that it was clearly uh, pulling us into this ongoing debate, but the author of the song actually didn't live in either Tacoma or Seattle. He lived in Olympia, uh, and he wrote songs about all three cities. So he was clearly uh, making music and uh, publishing that music and making money off of that music, just utilizing the conversations that were happening in the Puget Sound region. He didn't necessarily have... Uh, have a horse in the race, shall we say. So this is the first example that we're going to listen to today. So I once again give my big thanks to Drew Shipman and let's hear a chorus and a verse. All right, our next example, You'll Like Tacoma, which is definitely a slogan that I'm sure many of you have seen in the past, uh, comes to us from 1909. And this is described as a patriotic march song. Uh, 1909 was a big year for booster songs all around the region because it was the year of the Alaska Yukon Pacific exhibition in Seattle. And this is a fascinating song because it is pitching Tacoma to the people coming to Seattle to visit without mentioning Seattle once in the lyrics. So clearly the audience for this song would have been people in Seattle, and yet we're just not gonna mention Seattle. Let's just focus on Tacoma, which you will like. <laughs> you will like Tacoma. This is another song that I'd like to share with you in, in live form. Uh, it's much better to get a chance to actually hear the music than to just listen to me talk about this one. So please enjoy. All right, changing gears a bit now, another song from 1909 that is not per se a booster song, but I wanted to give it as an example because it does show that there were other songs that weren't about advertising Tacoma 
weren't about promoting it as a, a place for business and residents, uh, but were simply efforts by local Tacomans to write music and have them locally published. So this is a love song, very common of the era, and it has words and music by a woman named Laura Beatrice Cameron, who uh, my research revealed was born in England, but was a longtime Tacoma resident and uh, is listed in the city directory for many decades as a music teacher. Uh, so clearly had the, the knowledge and wherewithal to, to write some music for piano and set some lyrics to it and have it uh, essentially self-published, uh, but published through uh, a small publishing company here in Tacoma. All right, I'm now gonna move on to two songs that are both related to the very significant event of the opening of Stadium Bowl. So the first of these is an instrumental, which is from 1910. Uh, this was written specifically for the June 10th and 11th grand celebration of the opening of the bowl. And the bowl was always uh, intended as a gathering space for all sorts of events, not simply an athletic field for Stadium High School, but fireworks shows, uh, visits by major figures. We've had presidential visits to the Stadium Bowl. Uh, we've had performances by John Philip Sousa's band in Stadium Bowl. So very much a civic gathering place. So very worthy of celebration. And as you're learning from the theme of this talk, Things that were worthy of celebration in this part of the 20th century had original sheet music produced for them. So this was a two-day event, which according to the newspaper accounts had attendance of about 25,000 people. Uh, and similar to the uh, Rose Carnival that I talked about earlier, this event included parades and fireworks and sporting events and music. So I saw mention in the various newspaper accounts of this event that this particular march was performed several times during the event. It was an opening musical number. Uh, it would be used to transition between other events happening on the, on the floor of the bowl. So very much would have been in the ears of people attending this event uh, over a century ago. All right, then the other song that was written for this event, and this was more specifically intended to be sung, and even more specifically intended to be sung by Tacoma school children. It says so right on the cover, uh, in case it's too small for you to see, I'll read this, as sung by a thousand voices at dedication of Tacoma's great stadium. And specifically, those were elementary school students from Tacoma, lining the bowl and singing this song. The lyrics were written by uh, a woman who was a longtime teacher and principal in the Tacoma schools. So her desire to uh, be involved in something that celebrates uh, education and celebrates our children's involvement in this large event is not surprising. This is the last of the songs that we'll actually be listening to today. Uh, and as Drew and I discussed when we were uh, preparing this recording, it's interesting musically uh, it's actually fairly well written for the piano, uh, which is a little bit unusual for these examples. And the vocal range that's required is a little bit larger than what you might normally expect of elementary age children. So uh, interesting in that regard, but please enjoy.
All right, still in 1910, we come to our next example. So from what I've found in various archives, this few year period uh, from about 1905 to 1910 was the most prolific uh, in, in terms of these examples of sheet music published in Tacoma. Uh, I'm sure you're looking at the image and I'm going to explain it in a moment. It's a little bit of a strange image. Uh, this was a march written for Tacoma's Afifi Temple. Uh, Tacoma's Afifi Temple was founded in 1888 and was actually the first in the nation to form a uniformed brass band. Uh, that's a very common feature of those temples, but Tacoma's was the earliest. So this march was actually written for use around the country. The same music would have been performed in cities around the country, but the cover art was then customized for each location, uh, which gives us this extremely uh, unusual cover <laughs> with camels in the desert uh, that appear to be marching their way towards Mount Rainier. Uh, I just, I, I can't get enough of this. That's such a, an odd juxtaposition. Uh, but just another example of Tacoma's well-established uh, club and temple and uh, social organization structure, many of those organizations having musical ensembles, whether they are choruses or bands, and therefore many of them having uh, customized music written for them. Okay, we now get to the song that I have found that actually gets at the naming of the mountain controversy. This is a song from 1911 called Mount Rainier, alias Mount Tacoma. I'm not quite sure what position the author is taking with that title. Uh, but this was certainly a major controversy in our region for much of this part of the 20th century. Frankly, still a conversation we have, right? Uh, but definitely in the early 20th century, a source of the continued rivalry between Tacoma and Seattle. Seattle was very much content with the Mount Rainier name, uh, not wanting it to be renamed in, with anything close to the name Tacoma. And Tacoma boosters were very interested in having it renamed. So very logical. Uh, once I got into this research, I was expecting to find a song written about this. And here it is. Uh, the author, George Gaffney, was from Seattle, but he doesn't um, really take sides in his lyrics. He appears to be trying to document the controversy in this song rather than uh, have it be uh, propaganda for either side of the argument. So let me uh, read uh, some lyrics from the chorus for you just to get that across. <clears throat> Now, fair Tacoma child, come listen here. I wish you this would understand. My name is not Tacoma, but Rainier, for so we're all taught in our land. It's so, exclaims Seattle with a leer. Taint so, retorts Tacoma with a sneer. It's Mount Rainier, Seattle remonstrates, a twinkle in her eye. It's not, Tacoma hotly postulates in posture to defy. And so this case is standing yet this day, and when settled to be, I venture not to say. So as I mentioned, not really taking sides, just sort of documenting this controversy. You're not hearing a performance of this because those, those uh, amazing lyrics uh, were set rather awkwardly to music. It's not a particularly fun song to sing, uh, but I did want to share those lyrics with you anyway. All right, another just fascinating example comes to us from somewhere between 1912 and 1916, based on my research of the particular versions of the uh, Columbia Brewing and Alt Heidelberg logos that you see here. Uh, so the Columbia Brewing Company was founded in 1900 and was a, uh, an anchor institution of Tacoma's brewery district for decades. This is a very unusual example. It was published in Tacoma, so it says uh, on the cover and also uh, inside on the title page, but it appears uh, that it was maybe used at a variety of locations with cover art customized for each city. Uh, it is a beautiful piece of sheet music. If we were in person, I would love to be passing it around the room so that everyone could see it. It has uh, bright, shiny gold on its cover and the music is handwritten. So just a, a very unusual and really very stunning uh, artifact. Uh, that is in the uh, Washington State History Museum's collection. But back to a more traditional Tacoma Booster song. Uh, this is another song about an event. 
Uh, this was the Montemara Festi uh, Festo or Festival uh, held over the 4th of July holiday in 1912. And this was the debut of Tacoma's new motor speedway. This was the era of Tacoma sometimes being referred to as the Indianapolis of the West. This was a major destination for car racing in a very early year of car racing. And this was another major civic event, similar to those I've mentioned earlier, with thousands and thousands of people coming from all around the region and, and frankly, all around the country uh, to take in the car racing, but also to spend time downtown, listen to music, watch parades uh, in the style of the day. And this sheet music is different than all of the others I've shared with you in that there is a song, uh, there is sheet music, but it also includes several pages of photographs of Tacoma's parks, Tacoma's major buildings. So this was very much an example of advertising Tacoma to an external audience that was coming to visit. This is one of my favorite examples, uh, not least of which because of the cover art. Uh, and this is the first of two examples I have that relate in some way to World War I uh, and exhibiting some patriotism over that war. There are two that I'll share here. There are actually a couple of others that I've come across, but this was one of the uh, instrumental marches that I've come across that is uh, patriotic and war related. And it was actually composed by an African-American composer who would go on to spend much of his career in Seattle, uh, but was living for a few years in Tacoma at this time. And you can see actually his own address uh, at the bottom of the cover art says published by Frank D. Waldron, 554 Cliff Avenue, Tacoma, Washington. That's uh, essentially now Schuster Parkway area. Uh, and he was living very close to his workplace, which was the Olympus Hotel. He was playing in the jazz band at the Olympus Hotel in the late teens before moving to Seattle and becoming a very prominent uh, instructor of jazz. Uh, in addition to his own performing. And probably his most famous student is Quincy Jones, who, when asked, very much refers to Waldron as one of his most important teachers. Here is the other uh, patriotic song that I mentioned, Tacoma, We're Proud of You. So this comes after the war is over, after soldiers have returned home. And this is a very interesting story behind this song, and you can see a lot of that reflected on the cover. You notice there's a lot of um, type that's probably too small for you to see here, thanking all of the people involved in uh, what was called the Northwest Peace Jubilee, another one of these major celebratory events around the 4th of July. More car racing, more fireworks, more parades. And the words and music for this song were written by the composer who's actually pictured on the cover, Edward Benedict, who was the organist at the Rialto Theater. The publication was funded uh, by the music stores in the theater district and then given out complimentarily to people participating in the events of the day. All right, I've come to my last example. There are more. There are more out there. There are more that are a bit later in the century, but this is my last that's really of this same era. Uh, and this is a song, again, the words booster song right on the title, just proclaiming it, I am a booster song. Uh, Tacoma, New York of the West, written in 1924 by a man named Thorval Shevland. And I include this because it is such a great story about Mr. Shevland. Uh, he worked at the Tacoma Smelter for many, many years, uh, never leaving that job, but always writing songs on the side. <clears throat> he dreamed of being a successful songwriter. And there's a wonderful story that I came across that he shoveled coal on a train on the, on the way to and from New York City as a way of paying his way on that train to try to sell his songs. Took himself to uh, Tin Pan Alley in New York, tried to find buyers for his songs, tried to find an audience, was not successful, unfortunately, uh, for Mr. Shevland. <clears throat> but he did uh, connect with Bing Crosby, who of course was born in Tacoma, uh, had a few conversations here and there that almost made it. He almost had some success, but unfortunately passed away before ever finding that great success he was looking for. 
All right, I am very thankful to all of the wonderful archives that we have right here in Tacoma for helping me find and be able to actually tangibly touch these pieces of sheet music. It's been wonderful to share them with you. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the day when we can start gathering in person again, but in the meantime, we will keep uh, virtual programming coming your way from Tacoma Historical Society. Thank you so much.